The following podcast is part of the Underdog Sports Podcast Network. For advertising information or to find more great podcasts, visit us at www.theunderdogsports.com and follow us on Twitter at RealTheUnderdog. Okay. Well, let's put a record. We got the sun in Phoenix, too. 52 to... <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sunny in Phoenix podcast, a weekly podcast where we keep you up to date on everything Phoenix Suns basketball. My name is Charlie Erling, and as always, I'm joined by Mitch Krumpetich. Hello. Hey there, Mitchell. This week on the show, we're going to be talking about the NBA preseason. We got some dates set and a little information about how many games each team will be playing. After that, we're getting real close to the draft, so we'll have a bit of a debate on a couple of our favorite prospects, and then we'll give some uh, early hot takes for the draft as well. Follow us on Twitter, at SunnyandPHXPod. Same thing for Instagram. Go on iTunes, leave us a five-star review and a comment, and you will get a shout-out on the show. All right, we recently got some news about the NBA preseason, and it will take place from December 11th through the 19th. And with this... Teams will be able to request to play three or four games, and with those games, one must be at home. So we got a little bit of info about the preseason, three or four games. What do you think, Mitch? What I think is we are less than a month away from basketball. That feels good. We're, yeah, that's kind of weird to think about. We're really, really close. I know, and it's it feels like we, we got... During the shutdown last year, when the season got suspended, it was a real long break between then and the restart of basketball. It was great that we had the bubble, but I still feel like we missed something, and I'm so anxious to get back. Yeah, I agree. I think it might just be because that that stretch from March to July felt like five years. So... That might be why. And the bubble, as as fun as it was, it was weird. It didn't really feel like the season, even the playoffs. And the playoffs were great. It, it all went well. It's still, you know, thinking back on it now, in hindsight, it did kind of feel like Summer League, even though it was like a real NBA championship. Yeah, it, it really did feel like Summer League. I kind of got that vibe watching it. I don't know if it was just the court or what it was, or, or the backdrop of uh, not seeing the normal situation of, you know, you can see hundreds of fans behind and all the scorekeepers and stuff. It was all a little different, but, I mean, we still got to see high-level basketball. That was that was the main concern. Are these guys going to be ready to go? Are these games going to be fun to watch? And, you know, they, they delivered in that. So I think the bubble, it was definitely worthwhile and a good time. Yeah. Yeah, but I think just the the sense of normalcy is probably, or the lack thereof, is probably why it feels like there's something missing. Because normally around this time, you know, late October, early November, mid-November, the season's just getting started. It's just starting to heat up. And I think Halloween was interesting for me because the past few years, the Suns have had games on Halloween. I think right. it was just weird that, you know, normally we'd be talking about the season starting around that point and it wasn't happening, you know? So, yeah, I think, I know that this is a lot different from the lockout a few years ago, but in my mind, I'm kind of treating this season like a lockout season where, because that season started, the season started at Christmas. So this will be a little bit earlier than that, but um, I'm going to kind of treat it like that, and then hopefully we can get back on track for next year. Yep, hopefully that, that all works out because, yeah, as soon as we can get back to normal, that'll be great. So three to four games per team in, what is that, nine days. So yeah. a game every three days or not quite that, if you want it. I think uh, I'd like to see four games, honestly. Uh, if we had the choice as fans, obviously I'd want to see as many as possible, but 
you know, you get a new draft pick in, you're going to be swapping some guys, especially if we make a trade. That's what yeah. I'd really like to see, uh, see the guys get some run in preseason together. Definitely. Yeah. And I imagine we'll go play like the Lakers and the Clippers or the Kings and the Warriors or just teams that are close to us that we don't have to travel very far. That would Maybe make sense. To Maybe we play like the, the, um, the Mavericks and the Rockets and the Spurs or something like that. We could do that. Or, yeah, I could see any of the California teams and then having one of them come to us maybe or something like that. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, I definitely don't want to see him traveling all, all over no. the country to play four preseason games. But, you know, there's that talk about when that schedule comes out, it'll look a little bit similar to a baseball schedule, kind of like series with, games with teams that are close geographically so hopefully that's the way it goes yeah and that's fine i think another thing that i'm thinking about right now is having been watching football a little bit more than i typically would since it's you know the only thing on right now sports wise for the most right. part um seeing that look pretty normal you know the teams are traveling um like they normally would I think that is making the bubble seem really weird. Hmm. I've never really thought of the bubble as, like, weird as in overly cautious, do you think? I, no, I don't. I think it was legitimately cautious. I think it was very good in that yeah. regard. Just odd, you know, because we got so used to it. We were like, yep, this is what it's like. There's no fans, and the court doesn't look the, how it normally would, and all the camera angles are different, and we just got used to it. And then to watch football, how it just normally is, there's just way less people. Yeah. I think it's like, yeah, this is pretty normal. But, I mean, if you look, every week there's guys in the NFL getting COVID. So, you it's know, very true. The, NBA, yeah. the NBA definitely did the smart thing. But football looks fairly normal right now. Right, and I mean... Talking about football, last week the Miami Dolphins were without five of their assistant coaches. So imagine if five of an NBA coaching staff couldn't make it to a game and had to right. miss a week. That, that'd that be rough. So, yeah, the, the NBA bubble, it was a lot, but it worked so well. Yeah, it really did. And, yeah, I'm sure soon we'll get more official word on, you know, what Suns games are going to look like this season. We've, we haven't got anything definitive about it yet so i'm still interested to find out how that'll be going because i'm ready yeah. to go i'm ready to go to a game i don't know when it'll be the best time to do it but man i i miss it i'm, I'm ready for some live basketball again yeah i'm ready to go safely <laughs> um yeah. you know i i am looking at what the warriors are trying to do because they're looking at doing a 50% capacity kind of deal where in order to get in, you have to prove you've either been vaccinated or have had a negative test like the same day. Or they're, they're even looking at having some rapid testing available at the arena, which I think is great. And it reminds me, uh, well, I was reminded of this when I was listening to um, Amir Blumenfeld's podcast, Buckets. He, he was talking about a survey that he filled out from the NBA. And I actually filled out the same survey. It was sent to, I think, anyone who had attended a game in the past year. And it was just asking about what kind of things you would want in order to attend a game. They were asking you, like, you know, how much news are you consuming? How much do you know about COVID-19? All of that kind of stuff. And then what would you need in order to attend a game? Um, what kind of things would you like at the arena um, what differences would you like to see implemented? And, you know, I, one thing I answered was I would want rapid testing available. Like I would, I'd be more comfortable going to a game if there was rapid, uh, like accurate rapid testing. Sure. So it, it sounds like they're listening to the people who have been taking these surveys. Yeah, that's, that's uh, great. I, I'm all for that. And I mean, it's better than nothing mm -hmm. at, at the absolute least so yeah yeah i am I'm, I'm still on the fence like uh, i don't know that i would be going to an nba game before a vaccine is widely available but 
we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yep. As long as I have uh, Fox Sports Arizona, <laughs> we'll be all good. Yeah. I have to get a little creative with that one now. Oh. I don't want to talk about that. That's disappointing. No, I don't either. It is disappointing. All right. Let's get into some NBA draft talk. And we've both been, Mitch and I both kind of have a, some prospects kind of high on our list that we both really would like to see in the Suns. Uh, mine has been dropping a little bit in some boards lately, and Mitch's has been rising up a little bit on boards lately. So, Mitch, do the honors. Start us off. Let's talk about your guy. All right. My guy that I'm looking at that I think is realistic for the Suns to draft at 10 is Kyra Lewis Jr. from Alabama. I like him. Um, there are point guards that I like more, but I don't think they will be on the board. Tyrese Halliburton, for instance. I don't think he'll be there. Killian Hayes. Some mock drafts have him available at 10. I think at the end of the day, he probably won't be. I think, I think if he's available, the Knicks would take him. So, yeah, I'm not sure he'll be available. I want to talk about Hayes real quick, though. Yeah. Sure. We both like Kevin O'Connor, right? Yeah, yeah, I like Kevin O'Connor. What do you think about Killian Hayes number one on Kevin O'Connor's big board all year? Ooh. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I, yeah, I agree with pretty much everything that guy says, I, mm-hmm. and he's he sticks up for our our sons. And he does. I appreciate that he about does. him. But that's the one thing where I'm like, man, your mo- your big board looks so good to me, and I, I like a lot of this, but that's the one thing I just can't get yeah. behind. Yeah, that's that's tough. I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see where Hayes goes, but assuming he is not on the board at 10, I think Kyra Lewis is going to be a good fit for our team, and... I was watching a little bit of film on him today, and I, I've watched some in the past, but I was revisiting a little bit of it for this. And, you know, the more I watched him, the more he reminded me of uh, Leandro Barbosa type. He's getting all these comparisons to, like, De'Aaron Fox, which is fine. He's very fast. But I I just think back, of course, as a Suns fan, to the, the Nash Barbosa days. Um, and Rubio is a very Nash-esque kind of player. Definitely not as good of a shooter, but, you know, the the distributing, the basketball IQ, all of that. And so I was just thinking about how Lewis would be such a nice change of pace as our backup point guard. Very different from Rubio. He's really fast. Um, Lewis is a decent shooter. Um, he shot 36.6% from three last season. Um, So not, like, amazing, but decent. And then he's a good passer. Again, he's very fast. Um, His free throw percentage last season was 80.2%, so a little bit to be desired there. But anything over 75, you're really going to be okay with. Um, And I just think the stuff he does outside of scoring is really nice. He averaged 5.2 assists per game last season, which for college, that's a ton. Mm -hmm. If a guy can average four assists in college, that's great. So 5.2 is awesome. Also 4.8 rebounds. This kid is 6'3", 165 pounds, according to ESPN. And he averaged almost five rebounds a game last season. And it's in the SEC. So you have some decent teams in the SEC. So I, I like that kind of stuff. And I think those are some of the things that Rubio does well, too. You know, obviously the assists. Uh, Rubio will have those triple doubles here and there. He'll grab quite a few rebounds just being in the right place at the right time. Um, and, I mean, Lewis also averaged uh, 18 and a half points a game. So he's not slacking on points. But, yeah, he's fast. He, he runs the pick and roll well, which we do a lot. He can come off a screen very quickly. He can try to get to the rim. He needs to work on his strength. But I think that's the thing that I like about him the most. His his downsides are all things that can easily be fixed. You can get stronger by lifting weights. 
you know, the intangibles are all there. He's also young. He's a sophomore, but um, he was he's one of the younger sophomores. Um, I'm not sure if he's 20 yet. I think he's still just 19. So younger guy, but it's easy to gain strength. It's easy to put on muscle. Well, not easy, but for NBA guys, you know. Right. It's not like he's going to have to learn a different game or anything like that. He's ready to go. He'll have to get stronger, yes. But, yeah, his weaknesses are very, you know, can be fixed very easily just by training. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And, I, you know, I bet a lot of the things you just said, those were probably things that were said about De'Aaron Fox when he was coming into the draft. Yeah. And uh, I like the Barbosa comparison. Because it's just that, one, that speed. When you have that kind of speed where it stands out in a field like the NBA, like when when you're blowing by guys who are already just supreme athletes like that, that is something that stands out. Barbosa definitely had that. And uh, Fox had it too. And here's here's where I go a little bit back and forth on him. I saw this one comparison that it... I uh, really agreed with it. It was that Kyra Lewis Jr. is just a taller-ish Smith. Yeah. But, uh, Mm -hmm. see, I love that pesky aspect in a point guard. And you know what? Ish Smith having a pretty decent NBA career. He's sticking around. He's getting paid. I mean, what more can you really ask for? He's getting good minutes even as of last year. So, yeah. I, I like that. And, you know, maybe that's the that's the low end. He's a taller-ish Smith. But then maybe mm-hmm. he turns into a Barbosa. Or, man, maybe his offense comes around to a point just like De'Aaron Fox's did. I, I think mm-hmm. he surprised a lot of people. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot of upside with him. And, yeah, yeah, we got Rubio there. Put him behind Rubio for two full years if we want to. If he outshines right. Rubio, we can try to... Trade Rubio, but mm-hmm. what a great point guard to learn behind. And even if it's yeah. uh, even if we do this Chris Paul trade, then he gets to sit behind Chris Paul and learn for a couple of years. Either way, those are a couple of great potential mentors to have. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I mean, I have seen some pretty negative stuff about him as well. I saw someone say his best case scenario is Darren Collison, and his worst case scenario is Colin Sexton. I, think I don't think that's right. Sam. That was Sam Vicenny's podcast. Yeah. I saw that yeah. too, and I was like, "Who? What did Kyra Lewis? Did he spit in your cereal or yeah. something? Like, what's I'm going like, on here, man?" That's not. <laughs> I don't think that's accurate. I mean, I think he really could be a De'Aaron Fox type. And when you say he's pesky, you know, he averaged almost two steals a game last season. One point eight steals a game, which I really like. The other downside, though, is. He gets himself into trouble sometimes. He's not quite strong enough to finish, and he tries to do a little bit of the Kyrie type where he just dances around in the paint. And he he averaged three and a half turnovers a game, which I don't like. You know, I mean, that's plenty. Yeah, the assist to turnover ratio is still okay, but not, I mean, that would have to get cut way down. Three and a half is too much. Yeah, and I, I'm not going to say I've watched a ton of Kyra Lewis game film, as in full games. I've seen highlight videos, but I, I didn't watch a ton of his actual games. But I'd, I'd guess that he gets a little too far ahead of himself for a lot of those turnovers. Being a, being that fast, having to run the point and handle the ball that much, I, I'm sure you get a little ahead of yourself at times and make some pretty foolish turnovers. But, you know, again... He's probably not going to be in a position where he needs to go start for an NBA team or anything like that. And, you know, get a couple years of practice with an NBA team. Those are things that can get fixed up for sure. Right. And I think in this situation, too, we keep campaign on the team, you know, have him start as the backup point guard at first and let him and Lewis battle it out. And if Lewis overtakes that spot for backup point guard, then great. But we saw a lot, especially in the bubble, but all throughout last season of Monty with three point guards on the floor sometimes with right. Carter, Payne, and Rubio or some combination of all of the different point guards we had on the team. So 
I, you know, I'd rather put Kyra Lewis out there than a couple guys on our team, I think. Right. And yeah, to, to wrap up Kyra, if he's available at 10 and Halliburton's gone and Ball's gone, and we'll, we'll assume that Hayes is gone, th- this is definitely my top point guard on the board. Uh, this is this is the way I go, for yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. A guy on my board that I've seen falling down a lot of mock drafts lately is Obi Toppin. This is a guy at points, he was projected to be a top three pick. And then we see maybe more like a top six. And I've seen in situations now where he's sliding all the way down to the Suns. And if you've watched any tape on Obi Toppin, you have to think Amari Stoudemire. You absolutely have to see the similarities there. Uh, you know, the 6'8", 6'9", pretty well-built frame, 220, 230. Every website you look at has different numbers, so we'll know once he actually gets uh, drafted. But you see that explosive athleticism, and you just think, man, this guy can uh, can really fit in in a couple ways with the Suns. And he's 22 years old. Uh, technically, uh, he had a red shirt year in there, so he's a red shirt sophomore. He'll be 23 during the season, and we know that's something that we don't really shy away from in Phoenix. We we like the guys who are a little older, maybe a little more mature, but they've seen plenty of game time, and uh, I think that's something we really value for the Suns. So I I always think about that. But six nine, six eleven wingspan. He wants to dunk on you. He's not the greatest rebounder or the greatest defender, but those are a couple things that I, I think could come a ways, a ways along. Think about all the times we, we heard that Aiton can't play defense. He really turned it on towards uh, the, in his sophomore season. We really saw him improve on defense, so why can't a guy like Obi Toppin do that? And uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. one last thing to bring up. He was the Naismith College Player of the Year last year as a sophomore. And uh, another power forward that did that as a sophomore, Blake Griffin. I see that comparison a little bit. Yeah, okay. Last year, uh, another power forward won it, Zion Williamson. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we want to keep track with the uh, Suns' longstanding tradition of having a Naismith College Player of the Year on the team. And uh, we might not be bringing back Frank Kaminsky next year. So this is the perfect replacement, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you sold me with that one. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I would. And one, one thing to wrap it up, I, I briefly mentioned this, but he, he's mainly projected as a power forward right now with, with the 6'9", and he's not, he's not a banger down low, so it seems like a power forward might be the way to slot him in. But at Dayton, he played a ton of center. I think the majority of his minutes were at center. So if we're ever to move to, a, you know, Aiton needs a blow, we want to go small. Toppin's a guy we can potentially throw that out there at center. And, you know, we have Diallo that could maybe do that. We saw Dario do a little of that in the bubble. We don't know if Dario will be back for sure. So I like the idea of bringing in a little bit of beef, a little bit of size with Toppin. Just seems like it might be a nice fit long term. Yeah, these are all good points, and I like Toppin. He's a good player. I wouldn't be mad if we if we had him. Uh, I was listening to Zach Lowe's podcast with the the old um, Draft Express guys, and they were speaking pretty highly of him too. I mean, they were making the Amari Stoudemire comparison, but they're saying Amari, but he can shoot the three, and that sounds pretty good to me. You know, they brought up the fact that he played center for most of his college career, and he would have to move to the four. He isn't quite big enough, and his his defense is not great. But uh, it's like you said, with with Aiton learning and getting better in that regard, and I, I'm one of those guys that favors offense over defense to begin with, so... I, I would be okay with this. He, like you said, he wants to dunk on people, and I like that. We've we've seen a lot of the opposite of that 
with some of our European players like Dragon Bender. <laughs> or even with DeAndre Ayton. Right and now. with Ayton, yeah, yeah. So it would be nice to have Toppin in there come in really aggressive, wanting to just posterize the other team all night long. That would be pretty cool. So, yeah, I mean, I think Toppin would be a good fit as well. And he is dropping a little bit. I I wonder if he will be available. A lot of times when these guys drop in the mocks and that kind of thing, it's it's a little bit uh, just just a little bit of a red herring. Sometimes yeah. they do get drafted higher than than expected or maybe closer to their original position that was mocked. So, yeah, we'll have to see. Right. And Yes, he wants to dunk on you. Like you mentioned, he can stretch it out to the three. He also has pretty nice touch inside. I've, I've seen a, a little bit of a floater game come to life there. Hmm. So once he gets in, it's not always a dunk. He can uh, settle for a floater. I like that. Also a pretty solid cutter, too. Hmm. With, without the ball, he can uh, he can make a nice cut. And But the one thing is, with his size, he's, he's never been much of a low post player. Hmm. So... That's something you got you got to kind of take out of the out of the playbook, but man, that's pretty much out of the NBA playbook nowadays, anyways. So that doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah, it just makes me think of well, okay, who who do we see in the low post nowadays? Okay, Aiton sometimes, Dario too often. That's it. My favorite's when Booker gets the ball in the post. Oh honestly. well, yeah, that's yeah, that is fine too, because that's hard to stop. And okay, the. I, I like Obi, but the one thing that's been throwing me off, we see this insane vertical jump. I, I mean, two feet above the rim, catching alley oops and stuff. It's yeah, he can really get up. So why does he look so tight? Like his shoulders and his back look tight, and then he can't move laterally, like uh, mm -hmm. like you'd expect a guy of his athleticism. It's it's kind of odd, but you know that again. I think that's a that's strength and conditioning coach. Like, hey man, we're gonna we're gonna get you moving a little quicker. We can do this. And I'm sure I'm sure they can do a little something to turn him into a you know, an average defender after a couple of years. I, I'd never throw that away, but it, it could happen. Yeah, I imagine <laughs> that same kind of thing happened with Aiden too. Strength and conditioning at the NBA level is gonna be different than college. So yeah, I mean I, I agree with you. He could get to that hopefully average level, slightly below average. So be it. It's fine. So, and yeah, Toppin would be cool. Lastly, with Toppin, you know, this is a, it's a little Kelly Oubre insurance. I don't know what we're going to do with Dario this year. Gambo said something about Baines and Kaminsky are unlikely to be back with the team. So, you know, we're, we're losing quite a bit of, of big there. So, I, I don't know. It just feels like it wouldn't be a terrible idea if Kelly isn't back on our team next year. We're going to need a bigger guy who can uh, match up with other fours. Maybe that's Cam Johnson, but I, I like Obi Toppin there too. Yeah, it, it's the NBA. You can never have enough good wing players, stretch for players. It's a hot commodity. It's always going to be unless things change and go back to how the league was in the 80s or in the 90s, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah. I doubt no, it. I, I'd like I, to see I, some no. of that come back, some little parts of it, but uh, I like the I like watching guys shoot threes, too. We, we know too much about basketball for things to go back to that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably true. That's probably yeah. true. Yeah. So who else do you like on the draft board that might be there when the Suns are picking? Yeah, well, I, I want to go into my hot take a little bit here. I really, really, really like Tyrese Halliburton. And if he's there at 10, it will be a miracle. But I would be so happy to get him. I think he's great. My hot take is that he's going to go top three. Oh, that's pretty hot. Yeah, he's. I think he's great. I think so, he is so good. If he's going top three, does Ball go top three, too, in this scenario? Oh, I think Ball's going to go one. Ball goes one. Who goes two? Yeah. Two, probably Edwards. Okay. All right. That's interesting. That's I've seen, my uh, three. 
I've seen Denny rising up lately too. He might I've seen him flirt with a top three pick in a few scenarios. I wonder I wonder where that's gonna land. I yeah. I saw something about Halliburton though. I think it, we may have uh, seen the same comparison. Mm-hmm. Do you see uh, the Lonzo Ball as a yeah. high point comparison? Yeah, what do you think I about did. that? I think he could be better than that. Yeah. You know, I think back to to Lonzo Ball's situation, and I think he was set back by having all the spotlight on him with the Lakers and with his dad being so vocal and everything. I really think that did hinder him. I think Lonzo Ball, I think he's a good player. I think he's a very good player. And I think he could be even better, but there was so much pressure at the beginning of his career that people had just such high expectations for him. And I think that got to him. So, yeah, I think Halliburton, I think he really... I think he will be a high pick, but I think he can fly under the radar in that the expectations won't be like Lonzo Ball or anything like that. Hmm. I like that. So do you think, to switch it a little bit here, LaMelo Ball, do mm-hmm. you think he's uh, it's going to be a lot easier for him in that aspect, or do you think he's been so hyped up already it's you know pretty much the same level? I think it'll be easier for him because – we're used to the Ball family at this point. LeVar, when's the last time we heard anything from him? It's been yeah, you, you have to look time. for it now if you if you want to find yeah. it. you got to go look for it. Yeah, and he's been a professional for a while now. I think LaMelo will be fine. And, it, I mean, he's better. He's just the better of the Ball brothers. Hmm. I, I agree with that. I do. Yeah, I like so, Halliburton too, though. If if he's there for the Suns, I'd be I'd be all over that, and I think oh, that'd be that'd be amazing. Yeah, you know, again, we talk about if we're drafting a point guard, it's probably not going to be a better point guard than Ricky Rubio, and if we trade for Chris Paul, it's definitely not going to be better than Chris Paul. So, man, anyone we get, and like even Halliburton, who's who's a heady player, who's a you know I like six almost six and a half assists. In the NCAA last year, that's nice. That's really him, nice. Let these guys grow behind Rubio and CP3. That's that's really what I want to do. I can say, yeah, I want Toppin, but man, a point guard of the future would sure be good to have next to Devin Booker. Oh yeah. And then the size too, six five. He's he's skinny as a rail, but right. You could you could beef that up. Oh, and he will. He totally will. But yeah, I think Charlotte at three. I think they're going to like him. I think, you know, they they have been looking for a, a replacement point guard for Kemba. Terry Rozier <laughs> yeah. did, did not work out. So, yeah, I think, I think it could be a very good fit in Charlotte. If not, you know, Chicago, that could be interesting too. They have Kobe White, but maybe they could go well together. They have yeah. Zach Levine too, but I mean, it's okay to add a guy like that to those. You'd two. argue that you could put those three together. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, so one guy that I like who fits the James Jones plan that you know maybe this is a touch bit early for him, but he's a guy in the draft who's very similar to Cam Johnson in one aspect. This is the best shooter in the draft. And Aaron Neesmith from Vanderbilt, he's a sophomore, he's 21 years old, and he shoots absolutely light, lights out. And, you know, this is another wing. We're getting pretty heavy at wing right now, depending on what we end up doing this year. But I think you get another guy who can shoot absolute lights out to be able to spread the floor with whoever else you want to throw out there, whether it be Booker or Rubio or, you know, a guy like Aiton who demands some attention. You get Cam Johnson and Aaron Neesmith sitting out there. It's going to be bomb squad. We're going to be hitting a lot of threes. And he it just seems like he's a guy that fits in the James Jones system. So if, if someone goes a little early, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, Neesmith. And I'm surprised his last name is pronounced Neesmith and not Naismith or yeah. Nesmith. I didn't know that either, but... Do you think that might be a situation where we trade down 
and he is still available, or do we have to take him at ten? No, he won't. He won't be there at ten. I I mean, he'll be there at ten. We won't need to take him there. We could probably go back down, but okay. I'm just big on that because, uh, you know, you look through the draft, you see who's the best at what, and I mean, it's undoubtable that he's the best shooter here. So I, I like that. Yeah, well, it worked out with Cam Johnson. Right. So. And, you know, if people lose their minds when we draft an older guy, I'm not going to I'm not gonna join that bandwagon again like I may have last year and been like, what in the world, Cam Johnson? I'm just going to say, all right, James Jones, I, I believe you. Let's see what he's got. Yeah, yeah. I, I would be fine with that, too. So how about any more, uh, any more guys at ten that you like, or should we get well, into? Do you some want to talk about Bay? Do you want to talk about Bay? Well, I, I kind of wanted to just take that all the way out of there. That, oh, that's... okay. No, that's fine. Okay, I'll just take okay. that all out. Okay. Yeah, my bad. No, that's fine. It's a rough night, brother. We are fine. I mean, that was my only hot take. So okay. if you have one, go for I'll, it. I'll keep going here. All right. I got some more hot takes if Aaron Neesmith potentially going number 10 isn't hot enough for you. And I, I, this isn't about our pick anymore. This is just general draft. I am in love with Grant Riller out of the College of Charleston. He's a, he's a senior... I think he's 23 or he might almost maybe 24. He's just 6'1. Uh, and there's something about him that makes me feel just so so excited to watch him play more. I don't know what it is exactly, but the way that he scores is really fun to watch. And there you can do we can do comparisons one or two ways. One guy that I really see is Lou Williams, and that's just a total play style thing. He's instant offense. He's going to come off your bench. He's going to find ways to get buckets. And that that's a that's a nice tool to have. Look how many sixth men of the year he's won and uh, what, what he does for his team when they're in the playoffs and they need a little burst. I love that, and I think Riller's a guy that can do that. But then you can say... Man, this guy who was playing at the College of Charleston, that's not good competition. If he's any good, of course he'll just dominate all these guys. But look at all the other point guards who have done exactly that. Steph Curry at Davidson. Uh, Damian Lillard at Weber State. Fred Van Vliet at Wichita State. There's, there's probably a few McCollum, more. McCollum, Lehigh. There you go. There yep. you go. Mm -hmm. there, there's so many occurrences of that. So why can't it be this guy? And, you know, maybe I'm uh, really in on the James Jones system, too, where I want a guy who's played a little bit. I like that idea, and this guy's a senior. He looks like he's ready to go. He's going to be a first-round pick. That's mm -hmm. my hot take. Grant Riller's going in the 20s. I'm okay. calling that. I would like that. Yeah, it's recorded. This is going to be broadcasted. I'm saying that. <laughs> Coming at you live. <clears throat> That's right. But everywhere <laughs> else you see Grant Riller like in the 30s and even in the 40s in places. But lately I've seen a few people coming around. But for months I've been pro Grant Riller. Uh, one of my favorite players in this draft, no doubt. And, and then. Yeah, this is the first I've heard of him. So that is a hot take. Hot take. <laughs> hot take right there. And then on the opposite end, I've seen. Alexei Pokushevsky. Nice. I've seen him go insanely high in some drafts. I just did a, a podcast with, I, I talked with Zandrick Ellison from the, the Underdogs NBA show. And I was making a pick for the Suns at 10. And I was getting updates of who was getting picked so I could, you know, prepare for who I wanted to take. And Poku here went number nine. And I was so wow. shocked. And I wanted to have a little more time to go in on that pick. Because this is this is absolutely the draft hipster pick. 
Ah, uh, there's I there's see. no idea that you can think that this guy is going to be a lottery pick. He plays against either 37 year old men or 15 year old <laughs> men in Serbia. It's you, you can't. I don't know how you can say that he is the the next coming of whoever you want to say. It, Dragon Bender. Yeah, if anybody, that's who it is. Like they're like, oh, he can be like Jokic the way he handles the ball and passes it. Like yeah, he's he's seven feet tall. He doesn't weigh 200 pounds. I I bet a few bucks on that. He's so skinny. There's no way it's going to work out. Yeah, he's just 19 years old, but I mean, it, he's he's 3 years away from being a year away. We've been burned too many times on this no, kind of thing. There's there's so many similarities to Bender though. You watch his highlights and you're like, "Wow, this dude can dribble. He can pass a little bit." Uh, he moves okay. He can play a little defense. He's blocking shots. Oh, he can stretch it out to the three. Man, this guy can do everything. Yeah. Oh, Tony Kukoc comparison. I guarantee. <laughs> or or if you want to go crazy, I saw Lamar Odom, and I was like, wow, oh, that's rich. That's rich. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he'll ever reach a Lamar Odom level, but, man, that's my one where I, I say, let's pump the brakes. Yeah. This guy shouldn't go, man. If if I were the GM, I wouldn't take him in the first period. But right. if if he goes in the twenties, I wouldn't be absolutely shocked. But all these places putting him top ten, eh, I don't know about that. Yeah, that's it. It might just be my experience being burned with these kind of players. These project players and all that kind of thing sometimes it works out it does sometimes but oh that's scary all right and well, white dragon bender oh <laughs> just like a glass of milk on my <laughs> <laughs> oh geez well with that we will move to our non-sports section of the show and we're gonna throw this back a little bit I used to give music suggestions every week, or maybe not suggestions, just what I was listening to each week. So we're going to go back to that. What are you listening to lately? All right. I think I've talked about uh, my man, Tom Mish, on the show a few times before, but I've been listening to a lot of his stuff lately. And so one of the newer songs that came out is called Night Rider, and it's with a, a percussionist named... Uh, Yusuf Days and he's a really great drummer and they have a couple pretty cool uh, like animated videos that they put out along with their songs I, I'm a I'm a sucker for a cool music video and uh, they definitely have a few of them but Tom Mish M-I-S-C-H you should definitely check him out um, I've been a fan for a while and he's he, he's been pumping out some pretty cool stuff so check him out alright nice I have. He's good. You sent me something from him the other day, and it was really good. I think we we found a Corey Wong connection. Yeah. Uh -huh. he, he had done some stuff with Corey Wong, who does yeah. stuff with Wolfpack. So, yeah, that's the that's Corey my Wong. circle there. Corey Wong has been doing some K-pop stuff lately, actually. My sister is really into K-pop. And I, I saw a video. He I follow Corey Wong on Instagram, and he said something about BTS – something around and i sent it to my sister i said what well, i don't get this what is it? she explained it to me that he's been doing this stuff with them arranging their songs and they're really good huh that's yeah. cool and i said that tom mish has been pumping stuff out Corey wong is yeah. like go check his spotify out he puts out a new song or a new album like every other week yeah. or something like he's that so lately good. He, he he's been so. going ham during quarantine, and he's a he's an excellent guitarist. Oh yeah, he's amazing. Uh, I've got a lot here, so bear with me. <laughs> uh, I'll start with the older stuff. There's only one, yeah, one thing that's not that hasn't come out super recently. I found this band recently. I don't know what they're doing. They haven't put out anything in a little bit, but they're called Sea in the Sky. And they have this album called Everything All at Once. And it's just like a prog metal dream. It's so good. I really enjoy that. Um, they have a song. Their, their first song is called Dreamer. And I really like that. And then they have a song called Neck Romancer. Which the title's Got fun. it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. 
Good song, though. Uh, the whole album is really good, so I've been into that. But the new stuff that has come out recently, I'll just go in order of what I'm looking at here. Within the Ruins has a song called Black Heart. Super heavy, like technical deathcore, really, really heavy. If you like heavy music, that's fun. Um, another heavy song is called Metamorph with Ocean's 8 Alaska. Ocean's 8 Alaska is a really, really great band. They're one of the most talented metal bands out there. Chris Turner is their drummer, and I think he's probably the best drummer in metal right now. He's really, really good. And just listen to that song. It's so good. I won't describe it because the first time I heard it, I was blown away. So that's really good. Uh, I also have been listening to Circadian, the new album from Intervals. Intervals is like a instrumental prog metal band, I guess. Aaron Marshall's the guitarist, and he's one of the you know best guitarists out there right now, up there with Sean and Polyphia and all of those kind of guys. So that's a great album, Circadian by Intervals. I also really am loving the new Ariana Grande album positions it's so good it's so good really really good i highly recommend i like how you just flip it like that that's nice yeah i i listen to a lot of different stuff but she's great i i think she's probably putting out the best pop music we've heard in a very long time um she check this out on adult swim ariana grande performed with thundercat and Mm. jd beck and domi i don't know if you know them there are these Berkeley School of Music people. Uh, Domi plays uh, piano, and JD Beck is a drummer. And I've seen them live and met them. And they're very eccentric, but very nice. Really, really, really talented. They opened for Chon one time when I saw them a few years ago. Um, and this performance was so cool. Check it out. Ariana Grande, Thundercat, JD Beck, and Domi. It was so good. I'll check that out for Thundercat, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And Thundercat and Ariana Grande are harmonizing, <clears throat> like, vocally, and it's oh. so good. Oh. Yeah, it is very good. That sounds fun. I, I will actually check that out. Yeah. I was going to send it to you, but I'm like, oh, I'll just say it right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Sunny in Phoenix podcast. The draft is on Wednesday, so next week we will be breaking down who the Suns took in the draft. And, you know, it's nice that we didn't do three, four full weeks of draft stuff because the Suns didn't have a top five pick. And we have no idea who's going to be on the on the market when we get to 10. So, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a blessing. But anyways, tune in again next week. We'll be breaking down those draft picks. Thanks for listening. Go see. There's blood on the floor And I can't find my heart Where did it go? Did I leave it in the cold? So please give it back Cause it's not yours today It must have fell when I lost my mind Deep in a cup